This is Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are now joined by Christina Garcia. She's one of the newest members of the California State Assembly. Congratulations, a tremendous victory. You grew up, metaphorically speaking, in the Bell movement, trying to met out the corruption in that city. How are you feeling? I mean, it's such an amazing opportunity and such a blessing to have this, but like any new job, there's definitely a learning right. curve. And so I tell folks to be patient with me, but I feel confident we're, we're going to be fine. But did you ever expect when you got involved in the Bell Movement that that would catapult you to a victory over a Calderon, one of the most well-known names in Democratic circles in Southeast Los Angeles, and then to the Assembly? No, <laughs> it was never my intention. Right. You know, but I think in general, my approach in life has always been if I'm doing something, give it my best, do my best, shine, and new opportunities will open up, and, and then being fearless when the opportunities open up and making were, the best of them. You were fearless to take on the Calderon clan. That was quite <laughs> remarkable. We congratulate you again. It's not surprising that one of your first bills that you introduce deals with education. You yourself have been an educator, and it focuses on the issue of cyberbullying. So why don't you explain to us what your bill does and why you think it's so important that this bill pass and be signed by the governor? So basically what happens right now is that if a kid is being bullied and it's happening outside of school grounds, uh, over text message, over email, over Facebook, and the school official knows about it, we don't have any jurisdictions to intervene. And so we're seeing the effects on campus on a regular basis, but we have our hands tied. So this bill would give jurisdiction to the schools to intervene when they become aware of it. They are not the only people responsible for intervening, but it gives them an additional tool. We've had students who have been bullied, who have approached school officials for help. The school officials have tried to help because they don't have jurisdiction and it gets thrown out. And all that has happened is that these kids then don't want to come forward anymore because they feel, well, nothing got done and I'm being bullied even more. But do you think that by passing a law that the courts will agree that it is appropriate for the school to have jurisdiction when, like you've said, if something is off campus, maybe a physical incident, the schools can't have jurisdiction. You know, it's dicey. I get the reasons behind it, but. I think the way technology works now and our kids are so attached to it, it might have started off campus, but there's no way that the kids turn off what's happening on Facebook at 5 p.m. and it's not on at 8 in the morning when they're in school. Everyone's talking about it at, on school. It, it's continued, the text messages continue throughout the daytime. So I think we need to just change the, the frame of because it started off campus doesn't mean that this does not affect the classroom and it affects the student's ability to think. It affects the student's ability to focus and their ability to feel like they're welcome in that environment. No, there's no doubt about it. Have you spoken with school boards, associations, or principals? What are they thinking about this? I definitely have spoken to a lot of school officials. I've spoken to to some kids and some parents who have been dealing with this and they think that this is something that's very welcomed and necessary as a tool to combat bullying. There's a new study that just came out that showed that bullies themselves are more likely to commit suicide down right. the age. Uh, the study, bullied or yeah, the bullies? The bullies. The bullies. I've, I've heard that before. And, and, the bu and the those that were bullied you know, are more likely to carry depression issues on the road and so the compounded issues before when it was just physical you know, it wasn't as rampant as now that it's on the internet, so we're going to see an increase in these cases. I think we need to start combating it sooner. Do we know if other states have taken this approach, or if so goes California or the rest the nation follows? I think we have a couple of states who are looking into this too, but definitely for me it's important that California take the lead in issues like this and the rest of the state issues. This is a national crisis and we have folks across the country that are dealing with this and young victims that are being victimized on a regular basis and are committing suicide also. You have these young Literally. kids that are I bullied. Mean, yeah. We have heard the Massachusetts case. I mean, a lot of the bullying was going on in, uh, on, in cyberspace. Right. Um, have you spoken with members in the Senate, Republican colleagues, the governor's office? Do you have a sense as to whether there's momentum behind this bill? I know you just dropped it, <laughs> but still, I mean, do you have a sense of where it's going? So in general, with all of my bills, you know, we try to be tactical about it nice. and, and we want to be successful. So we started off by thinking, is this something that the governor is likely to right. sign? You know, what's going to happen in my house and in the Senate side? And am I building the relationships to get things done? So definitely been working on building the relationships across the three houses so we can have success. But part of we're doing that process means I also have a much smaller bill load than other members have had in the Which past. Which some would say is a huge plus. I mean, some would say there are just too many bills being submitted, so I don't know if that's a demerit for you. I don't know about too many bills. I don't want to take a stand that way, but I think for me, at least, these are bills that I'm passionate about, that I feel I can speak out about and do it in a thoughtful manner and be successful and contribute to what, you know, what needs to be done. I want to ask about another bill, and it deals with our senior citizens in California. Yes. I was shocked when I learned from you and your staff 
that seniors who are victims of elder abuse do not have the same confidentiality protection right. as victims of domestic violence otherwise. Okay. Explain that process, how you learned about it and what you're looking to do. I think this is where constituents should be aware that, you know, even if we can't solve their problem, they should be reaching out to us because right. it identifies a loophole. And so this is how this came to us. It identified a loophole, someone that came forward and said, this is happening. And so we said, at first we thought this can't be <laughs> it's right. How is it possible? It's not possible, right. but there's these loopholes. And so we have to close the loophole and we have to protect these victims and tell them that it's okay. And I think especially for senior citizens who are being taken care of by sometimes people in their own households and there's this paycheck and this dependency, it's hard for them right. to walk away, you know, and there are these caretakers. And so this is really important for them to feel empowered to come forward and get the help they need. So under your bill, what exactly would happen? What's the protection for the elder? Basically, any communication that would that would be happening, we say, between the police or different agencies when they go report would not be sent to their caretaker. It would be addressed to them because right now it's addressed to the caretaker and the communication because that's part of but what the happens. caretakers arguably the abuser. Right. So we remove that that potential now and so you create and so things get addressed directly to the victim and uh, to where the victim would like it sent. It doesn't need to be sent to the home address. If they have a separate alternate address, they could be sent there. Along the same lines, you're looking at the question of death benefits. Yes. Um, I recently lost a relative and I was really stunned to learn how much it costs for even the most basic funeral. And for so many families in California, they simply want to allow the departed to leave with dignity and to right. allow the family to um, enjoy those final moments at the right. funeral procession. And yet so many families don't have that capability simply because of the financial situation. It, it puts people in a crisis. When this bill came to me, this came to me, I just thought it was the right thing to do for two reasons. So what, what would the bill do? Why don't you explain so, that? Basically, if you are part of the retirement system and you're a teacher, you get $6,000 worth of, your family gets $6,000 worth of benefits for your burial cost. If you're a classified worker, these are the janitors, these are the secretaries, these are the people in the copy rooms, people that help us have an environment where things run smoothly, they only get $2,000 worth. And so these are people that contributed 30 years of their lives to helping our kids grow and have a good environment, but we're not giving them the same respect. Right. And the crisis, these are also our people who are at the bottom right. of, the, of the income level, right. you know, and what crisis these moments put into them. So I just felt it was the right thing to do. And I couldn't, constantly I was thinking about my first year of teaching mm -hmm. and they were the safety net to get me through all the growing of pains of the first year of teaching and they're the ones that helped me learn the ropes. They were the ones that came in and took care of what I needed to do so that my classroom was okay the next right. day because I was struggling and so you know I just felt as important as I was. I can see I your was, eyes are welling up. Yeah. It's very touching. That's actually very, I'm very touched by the fact that you're touched. Yeah. Um, along those lines though I mean the state is doing better mm -hmm. economically. We don't face the deficits we did in the past but these are still tough fiscal times when you add dollars to any benefit, it can be a challenge. So will a bill like this be able to move forward because it is looking to spend more of the state's money? I did everything hoping for a 100% signature I rate. Understand. And so, you know, I definitely see the complexities and the additional monies that need to happen. And there's only one pot. And so from if we take money for something, we need to take it away for something else. And so I'm very clear about that. But Have you found offsets? But you know, and, and trying to find that. Right. I mean, we have time to, through course. the May revise. But the reality is that the crisis is now and not 10 years on the road when the economy is, re is ready. And so we need to think about what's happening now and doing what's right now. And so, you know, I'm at a minimum, I've committed to continue the discussion. As we move forward, this cannot disappear. And it's a hole that needs to be plugged sooner or later. How are the discussions, most generally? You know, I, I, I think in the Capitol, we have 39 new members in the right. assembly, which is half of the assembly right. basically. Yeah. And we're very cognizant that there's been a lot of cuts and the economy's trying to grow, but we're also very cautious about that growth and where we're going. And so I think most of my peers are like me, trying to learn what's going on, get our bearings and build those and relationships. And you have 12 years under and term limit we reform. we potentially have 12 potentially. years, it's okay. not guaranteed. <laughs> Ourselves and the voters need to agree oh, to that. Okay, her <laughs> name is Christina Garcia. She's a member of the California State Assembly. My name is Brad Pomerantz. You're watching Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We're now joined by Scott Svonken. He is a member of the Los Angeles Community College District, and we're glad to have you on the program again. And I want to speak with you about the fiscal situation for community colleges, presumably better, given that Proposition 30 passed, mm -hmm. but how much better? Well, it's a lot better. Um, it's not as good as it was five years ago. We've lost uh, at least $100 million over the last five years, but it's looking up. Okay. Um, this month, uh, I'm working on pushing out nine million dollars to the campuses for more classes that we couldn't have done if Prop 30 hadn't passed. That'll be hundreds of more seats in the classrooms so students can go to our colleges and pursue either a career or a job. Now the governor in his proposed budget has given about 700 million dollars more to community colleges than the current fiscal year. I'm sure that's welcomed but does that make up for all the cuts of the last four years? It doesn't. It doesn't. But it, but it makes the it made it so that we didn't have to cut forty million dollars. We would have had it if Prop Thirty hadn't passed. If the voters of California and we d we discussed this during we that did. election, you were pessimistic. Very I was, pessimistic. I was optimistic. I believed in the people of Los Angeles County and this state that they understood the importance of education, and they voted to keep classes moving and keep opportunity alive. Well, what's interesting is LA County, yes, it voted for Prop 30, but it wasn't because of LA County that Prop 30 won. I mean, Prop 30 did well throughout the state. It did. I mean, it was almost uniform. It got over 55% of the vote. That's a, that's a, that's a landslide. It is. It was a, it was a tremendous a vote of confidence in our community colleges and a commitment to K-12 education. The governor has also said as part of his proposed budget that he wants to link community college funding right. to community college's success in getting students to those four-year universities. Right. That's obviously the ultimate goal, but what do you make of this proposal, which still is in its embryonic phase? Well, it concerns us a lot. Um, the governor, I have a great deal of respect for. He actually served on the LA Community he College did. Board. It was his first office before yes. Secretary of State. Yes. So, but are you in his seat? I am do not. You know? I, I, I do know I'm Who's not in his seat. seat. Who has his seat? Do you know? Uh, I'll have I to find out. We'll I'll put it on the screen <laughs> if I figure it out. Okay, but it's really critical that people be encouraged to succeed and have an opportunity. But as a student myself, I I registered for classes and I didn't complete them, and but I did complete college. I I went to Pasadena City College and Cal State Northridge. Just because someone doesn't compete, complete the course doesn't mean the college shouldn't get paid because there's a value to the student and the college for helping me. It took me twice before I passed biology. It well, took me well, twice. Just because biology's hard. Right. <laughs> it's so, not because you were a flake, it's just hard. <laughs> but, but the governor has the right idea. We need to focus on student success. Unfortunately, the last couple of years. I've been on the board two years and the last two years we've been focusing on reducing services in classes, not helping people get through. And we need to be able to have the funding to support students that come to us. Most students come to us not prepared for English and math. We know that. So we have to have more help for students to succeed. But if there is going to be a tie between funding and matriculation to that four-year university, it would seem to me that even more funding will be needed because let's face it, we know over the last few years there were draconian cuts in classes, yes. in sections. We spoke about how there are some students, this is pre-Prop 30, they'd have to go to three different campuses just to get the classes that they need to get out into maybe three years. Right. It's not going to change overnight, but we're going to open hundreds of more seats this year and hundreds of more seats next year to make it easier for our students to successfully complete their courses. But defining success is a challenge because if you come to us wanting to become a chef and you complete half of the program and get a job offer and go successfully right. become a chef, I believe you've succeeded. But the statistics that are reported say you failed because you didn't complete now, it. Now, speaking of chefs, I think it's also fair to say that pre-Prop 30 and even post-Prop 30, there has been less of an emphasis placed on programs for chefs. It's been yes. all about getting people a four-year university. But what about technical vocational training? Well, many of our colleges, Trade Tech, East LA, the the campuses in the San Fernando Valley all offer career training. They offer technical training, the trades programs, and those programs help people achieve their dreams of getting an education and supporting their families. 
I think we need to reevaluate everybody's not going to complete a four-year college, nor do we want them to. There are going to be thousands of jobs in the trades right. in the next five yeah, years. It seems like the train is about to leave the station on this issue of linking funding to four-year matriculation. And if that happens, I mean, look, we've already seen the elimination of lifelong learning at right. community colleges, the ceramics classes, Correct. you know, conversational Yiddish or whatever right. it may be. H how do you not further cut career training if it's all about getting those kids to four years? I, I think we have to make a really powerful argument that people need opportunities to succeed and not everybody's going to go to Cal State Northridge, UCLA or USC. If they want to, we need to make it possible and we need to make their success part of how we get compensated. But if somebody wants to be a plumber, a carpenter, if they want to be an electrician, those are honorable professions with really good pay. Yet, if you look at the K-12 proposals, right. what the governor is doing is trying to change funding formulas, but give the K-12 systems more latitude, right. cut the strings a bit between Sacramento and the local school districts, but it seems as if he's doing the reverse for community colleges. And so, love what you're saying, right. but I don't see that being the direction of the governor. Well, we're having these discussions now. His budget and his blueprint for student success is a work in progress. And I believe that our governor is smart enough to understand that we need to help these students succeed. And by not paying us, if a student doesn't complete the class, doesn't help the student and doesn't help the college. We have to figure out how to get these people to take their classes seriously and to get all the way through to the end. And the end may be whatever that end, whatever that end is. Okay, I also want to ask you about what's known as adult education. Right. Interestingly, you know, if I kind of landed here from Mars and was asked, where do you think adult education is provided? I would say community colleges. Right. But it has not been that way not in California. Not traditionally. Not traditionally. It's been K-12 that's Correct. been providing it. The governor wants that formula to change dramatically. Now, that could be a boon for community colleges because that's where he wants to place it, or it could be just a, a, a calamity because you're dropped this program without you know, a, a historical memory of it. Right. What's your sense? Well, we're ready and willing and I think able to provide adult education. The challenge is, right. is that the budget holds, I believe, $300 million. Mm -hmm. The programs traditionally have cost in recent history $500 million. Mm. So um, the other problem is, is K-12s have been doing it and we need a plan to transition them to help people get from their local adult school to our community college campuses, I mean, or know, us to run the programs at the adult right. schools. I, I don't know a lot about this area, but it does seem like adult ed should be in community colleges. I mean, just kind of intuitively. Yeah. Again, I'm not an educator. And so, you know, intuitively, it doesn't seem like a surprise that someone's looking at this. But in your mind, is has the train left the station on this issue as well? That there's no question it, we're gonna see a transfer? No, I don't think so. I think because of the fact that 300 million won't immediately move it and that it's a longer term debate and discussion, I think that this isn't over. Uh, I do think community colleges can and should provide much of what adult ed provides. Are you alone or is that a view that we hear out of other community college districts? Well, we're hearing it across the state. We are. I recently hosted an event for the state chancellor right. and the brand new state chancellor ha has said he believes there should be a more thoughtful discussion on this issue and he's selected by the board of governors. So I think he will lead the discussion on where adult ed should be and how the transition should happen, if it happens. And when do we expect to really get a sense of where this issue is going to land? I, I think in the May revise a lot of these things because money drives a lot of the policy. And so I think in May, we will see whether the governor's proposals on student success are approved because you need a lot more money to help students get to completion than we've been given. Right. And if you're gonna move adult ed to community colleges, we need the resources to run the programs. His name is Scott Svonk and he is a member of the Los Angeles Community College District. When we come back, we're gonna speak with one of his former colleagues. His name is Phil Hugh and Scott was on the San Gabriel Unified School Board and Phil is now on Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Yes, we're now joined by Phil Hugh. He is a member of the school board for San Gabriel Unified. And as I said to Scott Svonken, your former colleague, you must be pleased, I would presume, with the passage of Prop 30. Oh, I am. Uh, so yeah, tell I me am. why. Be very specific if you can. Why am I why I'm pleased? Right. Why are you pleased as a <laughs> member of a school board in the San, in the San Gabriel Valley? Well, can I put on two hats real quick? Please here? do it. Um, as a school board member and both and, and as an educator, I teach at Cerritos right. College. Yeah, right. A, um, a community college. Right. So with both hats in both rows, I am phenomenally happy with this. Um, let me in San Gabriel Unified. Um, what happened was this basically averted roughly about four hundred and fifty dollars per ADA right. in additional cuts. Right, so that means we just saved about three million dollars that we didn't have to cut any further. And if you had to have cut, what would you have cut? I mean, you had to have had contingency plans. I, you know what? <laughs> or you were just not even, you were praying it wouldn't happen and didn't even look at A it. A big part of me was, <laughs> was right. in that mode where I was praying. Um, no, I mean, you know, I, I, we, I think what would have happened, not just with us, but with almost of all course, districts no, at this course. point, to, to shoulder another three million, that was for us, right? And we have roughly about a 43 million budget. So that's close so to 10%. That is. That's very close. Right. And that's only 43 now compared to about three years ago. We were up over 50. So we've already taken right. cuts. So um, let me ask you then, with Prop 30, will you be able to grow your budget back to where it was prior to the recession? We will not. We really? will not. Um, I think I think there's one thing that's important to note, that Prop 30 was essentially flat funding. Right. right? It's, it's temporary. It's flat funding. Um, the best thing it did for us and for all other districts, even at Cerritos too, is it prevented further harsh, harsh, possibly even very, very draconian cuts right. into the system. And, and so what have you done? Look, uh, the child who's in your school district right now just happens to be there because they were born and they are there at right. that moment. Are they just the unlucky and as a result, that's just the way it goes and they're <laughs> going to school at a time where there's less funding? Or are you still able to serve that kid in a way that they deserve to be served? I think we're still able to serve the students. We just have to get more creative about the way we serve them. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are some programs that are cut, that do get cut, that don't necessarily come back, right? Um, in San Gabriel Unified, we've had to eliminate certain programs like s certain foreign languages. We used to offer, I think, maybe four or five different foreign languages. Now we focus and concentrate on like two major ones, right? Which Chinese are, or Spanish, right. Mandarin and Spanish, mm -hmm. right? Which mm -hmm. in Southern California. Which makes sense. <laughs> right? Um, you know, I think we've tapered down on arts, right? Um, we still have a pretty decent ROP program. ROP stands for? Oh. Or what is it? What is ROP? It's, it's, kind of, it's very closely aligned to CTE. It's, um, it's CTE a career technical, it's Got career it. technical education. Got it. Um, we have a pretty good program, but it's what it has done is has prevented us from really kind of, while we can maintain the ROP program, it's prevented us from really being able to develop and grow a, a CTE program. Well, let's talk about, though, new funding formulas being proposed. I spoke with Mr. Svonken about this, and as you may have heard, the governor is proposing that the funding formula change for K-12. The LCFF. Yeah, yeah, which would allow school districts that serve more economically disadvantaged children to get more funding. Right. Which, you know, is a blessing and a curse, depending where <laughs> what school district you represent. Yes. But he would give local school districts more flexibility. Right. What do you think about that? I think right now, a lot of people are still kind of looking at it. We're still kind of projecting how this will work. But I think it will be a good thing for us. I think it's a good first step. Um, we get more local control, and I think there's like some 60 programs, right, that the state has kind of mandated that they haven't often or always funded <laughs> fully, right? right? It's so, those unfunded mandates we hear from Washington and Sacramento. Right. So, you know, I, I think I think this will help us get a better handle on our, on our own money, on how we use it. Um, we will, I think, with the LCFF, LCSF um, means um, local control funding formula, the it. governor's plan. Um, this means for San Gabriel Unified because we have a lot of um, students who are English learners and right. that's one of the, the, the kind of Criteria. target areas, mm -hmm. right, that they'll fund more. Um, we will be gaining more funding. Um, I think it's projected that we will go up roughly, I think, about 2,000 per ADA over the next five years. Which is nice, but what about those suburban districts that may not have English language learners. I mean, what do you say to those soccer moms? Um, Life, it's, it's yeah, the way it, it goes. Uh, it's unfortunate, but some of those suburban areas that you're talking about, um, 
they get, I think, already like somewhere f around 14,000, you know, per ADA themselves. But isn't it supposed to be that no matter where you are in California, aside from the basic aid school districts, that you get the same figure per student? That, Doesn't yeah. the Supreme Court require that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, no, that, that is true. But, you know, I, I think what it comes down to is at some point we have to look at it and say equal isn't necessarily always equitable. I understand. Right? There are areas that, that will need more. I understand. There is other funding coming down, though, in a program no one would expect. As you know, Prop 39 passed, yes. not Prop 30, and Prop yes. 39 closed a loophole that allowed out-of-state corporations to pick a taxing formula that was more advantageous for them, less right. advantageous for the state, and for homegrown corporations. Part of that money is dedicated to energy efficiency projects in schools. What a great idea. What a great what idea, a great no idea. Doubt. <laughs> And so there's, I guess, $400 million slated for yes. schools for energy efficiency projects. I don't know, maybe it's pork, maybe it's not, but be that as it may, it is what it is. <laughs> and look, it's probably a good long-term plan. Talk to me about what that will do for school districts. I think that'll help a lot of school districts who are perhaps overusing or right. wasting energy. Um, right. I know there are a lot of school districts whose buildings are old, they're still using you know, the old lights, the very old, inefficient, not really running as right. well anymore, you know, air conditioning units. I think you know, unless they go out for a full out bond and they're able to use all that bond money to upgrade all those things, um, this, is, you know, this is great additional money. Um, I think schools who are really outdated can really benefit from this. Um, I think schools who are maybe planning already. I know at San Gabriel Unified, we've been talking about this for at least seven, eight months. Um, and we are currently, you know, benchmarking classrooms already to see how we can better, you know, uh, be more efficient with our energy. You mentioned bonds and bonding. I want to ask you about another area that we're hearing may uh, be in flux. As you know, I think it was in 2000, the voters passed a proposition that allows school districts uh, to put a bond on the ballot for infrastructure projects that would pass with only 55% of the vote. That would be a passage. The school districts cannot do that for other general funding. They still need to get that 67% threshold right. that is required by Prop 13. Right. We have heard discussions about whether we should change the formula entirely and allow school districts, and frankly, maybe municipalities in general, to ask their voters to allow bonds to be passed for, in the school district's instance, general you know, salaries, whatever it may be. What right. do you think of that? I think that's a good idea. I mean, if we're talking about lowering that threshold right. in terms of the number of percentage of people that need to vote on it, I think that's a great idea. I think we go up to like 67 percent. That's, right. that's near impossible. It's near. very difficult. Right. As, as you know, Measure right. J, which was a Los Angeles County measure, right. that would have extended the Measure R sales tax for transportation right. projects passed in 2008, and it got 66.12 percent. I mean, that's a lot, of, yeah, but that's a <laughs> yeah, lot, and you need 66.66. Right. I mean, right. it is interesting, in a democracy, you would think majority rules. Right. But we have this provision called Prop 13 that requires two-thirds votes for certain taxing initiatives. Yeah, that, I think that is one of the uh, the kind of bittersweet, you know, the uh, dual-edged sword of Prop right. 13, right? Low I mean, property on, taxes. Right, on the one hand, it was great. On the other hand, right. <laughs> you know. A and so what are, are school districts, school associations getting involved in trying to push this forward because Look, I mean, even though Prop 30 passed, it still is difficult for schools to fund themselves adequately. Right, right. No, it is true. And I know um, I would be in favor of this, and I, but I think this is something that's still maybe percolating. I don't, I, think think it's kind of, I don't think it's made its way all the way down to all the local school levels yet, mm -hmm. but you know, I would definitely take this back to my fellow board colleagues right. and my superintendent and have them talk about it. I'd encourage other board members no, to, no to talk doubt. about I this No, no doubt. I mean, too. it's an important um, issue. Obviously, it would have to come from Sacramento to allow any school district should do it because it's a state right. law at this stage. Right, but you know, I mean, I think if we can lower that threshold, it would be great. I mean, look, look, Prop 30 passed, and that was, I mean, that was fantastic, but that was, man, the, I don't know if you stayed up that night. I stayed uh, up I watching shocked. all the returns. I was surprised. Uh, I didn't think it would pass. I've uh, said it before. It was, it was, just, it was like a <laughs> heart attack happening. <laughs> His you know? name is Phil Q. He's a member of the school board in San Gabriel Unified. I'm Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.